Kropotkin is of the anarchist side of the socialist side. The Conquest of Bread is something most of us on the left have read. It's a very important book. But you brought this out specifically because basically it describes today. This is 130 years ago, and it's describing the conditions today. Can you address your view of Kropotkin's words in this particular framework? Yeah, it's interesting. I read Kropotkin recently for the second time after ignoring it for years. (laughs) And I kind of read it with new eyes because I've been influenced by modern monetary theory. And I read it and I was like, wow, the insights that he is articulating are so close to some of the insights that we are articulating today and addressing some of the same problems. One of the things that he noticed when he was observing society 130 years ago, as you point out, was that even despite the fact that Europe at that time had unprecedented high levels of production, low by today's standards, but still high by the standards of any historical period, most of the population, even in Europe, nonetheless lived in misery. And he was asking, why is this? And his answer was simply that it's because under capitalism, production was mobilized around whatever gives the greatest profits to monopolists. This is what he wrote. And he points it out, look, if a few rich men effectively manipulate the economic activities of the nation, producing what they want, what makes them happy and what enriches their lives, but nothing to do with what the masses actually require for survival. And so as a result, you have all of this labor and all these factories and all of this incredibly rich, fertile land organized around facilitating capital accumulation when it could be organized differently to meet human needs and achieve social progress. And so it's interesting because he's basically pointing to the fact that whoever controls finance Whoever controls finance controls production and determines what we produce. And this is an insight that we actually get from MMT, which is that the governments, a democratic body, could just as easily issue currency, thereby controlling money for public good, to invest in things that we know are necessary for ecological and social goals. And this is effectively exactly what Kropotkin is saying, that if we are able to bring finance and production under democratic control, we can organize it to meet human needs with existing capacity. And that's a very profound insight, I think. Now, of course, what Kropotkin did not recognize was that 130 years hence, we would be facing not just mass deprivation as a result of the perverse orientation of the productive system, but also devastating ecological crisis. And so the challenge that we face today is not only to reorganize production in order to meet human needs and achieve what Kropotkin called well-being for all, which is the goal, but also to scale down less necessary forms of production in order to reduce excess energy and material use directly so as to bring our economy back into balance with the living world and achieve rapid decarbonization. And this is where the double objective of eco-socialism becomes clear. We have to build on what the socialists of the 19th century were saying and point out that we now have these two objectives, well-being for all, but also ecological stability. And our version of how the economy should operate and the principles according which it should operate have to take that double objective into account.